All righty, welcome back to our final panel. We are pleased to have with us for this panel, Ms. Danielle Iverson for the American Apparel and Footwear Association, Mr. Al Silverberg from selectshops.com and I think selectblinds.com, Mr. Ted Alcorn from Everytown for Gun Safety, Ms. Liz Hitchcock for Safer Chemicals, Healthy Families, and Dr. Stephanie Fox Rawlings from National Center for Health Research. Thank you everyone for joining us. Ms. Iverson, please, if you will. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Iverson, and I'm manager of government relations with the American Apparel and Footwear Association, also known as AFA. On behalf of AFA, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the Commission's budget priorities for fiscal year 2017 and 2018. AFA is a national trade association representing apparel and footwear industry, including its suppliers, manufacturers, retailers, and service providers. Our industry accounts for more than 4 million U.S. employees and more than $361 billion in retail sales each year. Product safety is of the utmost importance for AFA member companies. To support our members, many of whom are engaged in the production and sale of children's clothing and footwear, AFA has taken the lead in educating the industry on the development, interpretation, and implementation of product safety regulations. Thank you to many of you, as well as Commission staff, who have shared your time and expertise by attending a number of our AFA product safety events. AAFA offers the following recommendation on the, pro on the priorities the Commission should consider emphasizing and dedicating resources toward in the fiscal year 2017 operating plan and the fiscal year 2018 congressional budget request. International testing harmonization and mu mutual recognition of standards. AAFA firmly believes in the need for international testing harmonization as well as, the, as mutual recognition of testing to support product compliance and certification. When testing for compliance with a particular regulation, duplicative testing is counterproductive and does not provide any greater assurance of compliance. Presently, the Commission has the opportunity through the transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations between the European Union and the United States to promote global harmonization and mutual recognition of standards. European negotiators have signaled their interest in pursuing regular, regulatory harmonization initi initiatives with respect to textiles and apparel and the forthcoming TTIP trade agreement. Such an initiative could provide provisions relating to labeling, safety, market-driven standards, and bilateral cooperation. AAFA has long recommended including regulatory harmonization for both footwear and apparel in the TTIP, most recently at a stakeholders meeting during the 13th round of talks in New York and echoed last week in a joint footwear statement, which I believe everyone on the commission received. We strongly support the intention to harmonize technical regulations and approaches to guarantee product safety and consumer protection. Ideally, the, e the U.S. and EU should work to remove unnecessary and redundant testing by expanding of acceptance of conformity assessment bodies and moving towards a single international standard test method. Lastly, we note that an amendment to the CPSC's fiscal year 2014 operating plan, which passed 3-1, calls for guidance to be issued to the regulated community to ease unnecessary, burdensome, duplicative testing. And I quote, the Commission also directs staff to draft a statement of policy that sets forth a protocol for the submission of requests for determinations of equivalency between tests administered in CPSC regulations and comparable tests administered in international standards. Such protocol at minimum will re shall require requests for equivalency determinations to establish that the testing requirements of any alternative tests administered in an international standard will assure compliance with all applicable children's product safety rules, regulations, standards, or bans, and are as stringent or more so, including third-party testing, were required as the current CPSC testing requirements, end quote. Um, we urge the Commission to revisit the aforementioned amendment. Let me conclude by again urging the Commission to engage with the U.S. negotiating team so that the TTIP outcome has regulatory, regulatory coherence without sacrificing product safety. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments and suggestions. AFA looks forward to working with the Commission and furthering our collaborative relationship of ensuring product safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. Mr. Silverberg. Good afternoon. Select Blinds is an online retailer of window coverings, and I have made the trip from Phoenix to request for 2017 and 18 priorities to include and emphasize the need for cord-free legislation in the window covering industry. The reason is very simple. 
Window blinds with cords have killed or seriously injured, on average, 20 children a year. This is not new. It has been going on and has been documented since 1983. 33 years. There's no magic associated with that date. It just happens to be when this preventable hazard began being tracked. It's amazing to me that there are so many people that have no idea about these risks. I didn't know about it for years myself. A mandate to go cordless is only part of what we are requesting. We urge you to allocate sufficient funds to create, launch, and maintain a public awareness campaign. Select Blinds is a small business, and because of that, it might be easier for us to make the move to only cordless. But it doesn't take decades. We made the decision known to our suppliers in November of 2015. At that time, we had targeted January 2017 as the transition timing, but as soon as we announced that, I knew there was no way we could wait that long. We cut the cords on March 31st of this year, five months from notice to implementation. There are now three cordless-only retailers, SelectBlinds.com, Target, and IKEA. Select Blinds is the only retailer that is 100% cordless, including custom product. Target and IKEA have limited their offering to stock, or what is referred to as cut-down product. Either way, there is one simple reason why the three of us were able to make the change. Commitment. Select Blinds made the decision because we believe it to be the right decision. While we cannot force another retailer or the manufacturing community to follow suit, we feel that with the right coordination of efforts, this issue can be resolved to the satisfaction of all concerned parties. Three more retailers will join the cord-free commitment, Home Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart. The date that I heard was January 2018. That's 19 kids, I mean 19 months from now. Although this is a significant move, it leaves all custom products out of the equation. Upgrading to cordless is not a cost prohibitive move. First of all, there are three categories that have zero cost impact. Shutters, vertical blinds, and roller solar shades. These three categories account for about 30% of online sales. It's probably higher with in-home design consultants. Beyond those three categories, every blind or shade category can readily be made without a co with a cordless lift or cord inaccessible lift. The big guys already have the technology. There are also products like the Fashion Wand from Safety Shade that transforms a corded shade to a cord inaccessible shade. Our most popular product is the Cell Shade or Honeycomb Shade. It cannot be that expensive to make them cordless. We buy a stock cordless cell shade for well under $40 on the most popular sizes. The vendor from whom we source this product is making money, I'm sure. So the real cost of an entire cordless shade, including freight, to get it delivered to anywhere in the lower 48 states is less than $30. That's a finished product delivered. So it can be done by every custom manufacturer. Select Blinds has made the move. We are optimizing our product assortment daily. We would be in a more competitive landscape if we had every product on our site that our competition can offer. But even so, we are succeeding as a business entity with 100% cordless self-imposed mandate. I've been in the window covering business for almost 11 years. Prior to that, I ran a company called Uniden. We were the number one market share brand in the cordless foam business. I bring this up for a few reasons. One, I understand the way to develop products. I know how to communicate with the engineers, whether electrical, mechanical, or other. Two, I have been able to get products that product development teams don't believe can be brought to market from concept to mass production dozens of times. Three, new products are the lifeblood of any organization. They give the consuming public a reason to buy. This is a beautiful thing. It adds jobs in the industry. The time for discussion is over. The hope for industry self-regulation has come and gone. A mandate is needed, and that is what we are here to ask for. The industry is capable of doing this. Perhaps they just need to approach it in a new way. I'd like to suggest a mandate for all product to be cord-free by January 1, 2018. I'd like to suggest that the mandate include corroboration between retailers and manufacturers and a committee be formed by September 1, 2016 to oversee the progress. This is needed in order to get the focus where it should be. Put my name in the mix. I'm glad to be part of it. Let's quit playing Russian roulette with the lives of our kids. Issue a mandate. 
do it now. Do it before this tragedy touches one of you, one of our congressional members, or one of the key executives at the helm of a window covering company. Because that eventuality is very real, and then it will be too late for you to say that the reason you are issuing a mandate is because it's the right thing to do. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Silverberg. Mr. Alcorn. Good afternoon, Chair Kay, and thank you for the oppor opportunity to present my testimony today. Uh, my name is Ted Alcorn, and I'm the Research Director for Every Town for Gun Safety. Every Town is the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country, with more than 3 million supporters and more than 100,000 donors, including moms, mayors, survivors, and everyday Americans who are fighting for public safety measures that respect the Second Amendment and help save lives. I'm here today to address the burden of injuries inflicted by children who gain access to and unintentionally discharge firearms, an area of great concern to the public and one that the Commission has authority to address, and to urge the Commission to use its authority to enhance the surveillance of unintentional shootings of children. In 2013, consistent with the Commission's authority to regulate safe storage devices such as trigger locks and gun safes, the President of the United States asked the Commission to review and enhance the standards for those devices, a process I understand is now underway. Uh, we know that effective evidence-based interventions rely on a comprehensive and detailed understanding of the problem they are addressing. Unfortunately, current surveillance of unintentional shootings by children is woefully inadequate. In 2013, employing press reports in the media, every town identified 100 children, 14 and under, who died due to unintentional firearm injuries, nearly 50 percent more than the data, uh, the best national data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reflect. Furthermore, even our count was limited since it did not capture incidents in which a child fired a gun but harmed someone older, nor incidents in which the victim was injured but did not die. So last year, Again, using just press reports, every town created and has since maintained an open source index of all incidents in which a minor unintentionally fired a gun and harmed or killed someone. We consult with local law enforcement to confirm the details as necessary, and the data we collect are publicly available on our website, everytownresearch.org. And the patterns they illustrate could inform further approaches to reducing these injuries. In 2015, Every town identified 278 unintentional child shootings, which resulted in 88 deaths and 194 injuries. As of June, uh, as of June 1st this year, we'd already identified 100, and uh, as of today, we've identified over 110 further shootings. Uh, Three-year-olds pull the trigger more than children of any other age. And unlike shootings involving older children who typically harm another child, the vast majority of these incidents involving to toddlers, the toddler shoots themselves. We observe enormous variation across states in the rates of unintentional child shootings. Controlling for population, Alaska experienced these tragedies 30 times more frequently than California. Uh, most important from the standpoint of prevention, which is our goal, is the apparent role played by the responsible storage of firearms. Whereas fewer than 15 percent of gun-owning households with children report storing their firearms unlocked and loaded or with ammunition, those households accounted for more than two-thirds of the unintentional child shootings we observed. Though the public sometimes refers to shootings like these as accidents, a word that suggests they occur by chance, unforeseen, without reason, every town is very deliberate in describing these as not an accident. Because these tragedies are eminently preventable, if our society increasingly adopts norms of storing guns responsibly and evaluates our success at doing so. To promote that change in behavior, every town has developed a public education campaign called Be Smart, which gives gun owners and non-gun owners alike a way to share information about responsible firearm storage in their communities. And organizations across the spectrum run similar programs, from the Brady Center's Ask campaign to the Firearm Trade Industries Project's Child Safe. But to the measure of the effectiveness of any individual campaign from any other organization, it's essential to have an accurate measure of the outcome of interest. The Commission plays an important role estimating rates of non-fatal injuries of all types through the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, NICE. But more accurate information about unintentional child shootings will be critical for assessing the effect of current public health approaches. The Commission should adopt measures to improve surveillance of unintentional child shootings through the NICE system. And the Commission might also consider establishing an open source uh, an open source measure of these shootings. Every town's index demonstrates the reach of online media for supporting these efforts 
and the Bureau of Justice Statistics recently adopted similar tools for tracking law enforcement involved shootings, which had, uh, which had been undercounted previously. To be sure, one agency alone cannot solve this complex problem, and other agencies must also play a role. Uh, it's essential to measure how gun storage behavior has changed over time, state by state, and the CDC ceased measuring this in 2004 when questions relating to firearm storage were dropped from their national behavioral risk factor surveillance system, BRFIS. The BRFIS coordinators should reintroduce those questions. Unintentional child shootings account for just a fraction of the tens of thousands of firearm-related injuries in the United States each year, but few cry out so strongly for prevention. Even one preventable firearm injury or death of a child is one too many, and I believe the Commission has an opportunity to make a meaningful contribution to addressing this problem, and it will save lives. Thank you, Mr. Alcorn. Ms. Hitchcock. Good afternoon, Chairman Kay and Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide our thoughts uh, regarding the Commission's agenda and priorities for fiscal years 2017 and 2018. My name is Liz Hitchcock, and I'm the Legislative Director for Safer Chemicals, Healthy Families. I'm providing testimony today on behalf of my organization and Safer States. Safer Chem Chemicals, Healthy Families is a nationwide coalition representing more than 450 organizations and businesses, including parents, health professionals, advocates for people with learning and development mental disabilities, reproductive health advocates, environmentalists, organized labor, and businesses from across the nation, including some groups who have already testified today. Safer States is a network of diverse environmental health coalitions and organizations in states across the country that believe that, that believe families, communities, and then the environment should be protected from the devastating impacts of our society's heavy use of chemicals. Our diverse coalitions are united by our common concern about toxic chemicals in our homes and workplaces and in the products we use every day. We work for reform of our outdated toxic chemical laws, work with retailers to phase out hazardous chemicals from the marketplace, and educate the public about ways to protect our families from toxic chemicals. Over the remainder of FY 2017 and 2018, we urge the Commission to expand its oversight and regulation of consumer products containing harmful and environmentally harmful uh, chemicals, making full use of its authority under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, the Consumer Product Safety Act, and the other statutes enforced by the Commission. In addition, we urge the Commission to make it, it a priority to move forward with rulemaking banning consumer products containing a class of toxic flame retardant chemicals as requested in the petition submitted in June 2015 um, by groups including Consumer Federation of America, Consumers Union, Earth Justice, and the International Association of Firefighters. While we appreciate the Commission's work over the past several years to implement the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act's regulation of toxic lead and phthalates in, cons in children's products, the work doesn't, shouldn't end there. Uh, American families are more aware than ever that toxic chemicals can be found in products in our children's playrooms, in our living rooms and kitchens, in hospitals and healthcare facilities, and in our workplaces with ongoing and irreparable harm to our family's health. The presence of toxic chemicals in child care products and children's products is one of many exposures to hazardous chemicals that our families face as a result of contact with consumer products. The Consumer Product Safety Commission should broaden the scope of consumer protect products it reviews for the presence of and health risks from hazardous chemicals and, and then take necessary action to protect public health, accounting for the increased vulnerability of certain populations including children and pregnant women. Thanks to state chemical reporting requirements in Maine, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington State, our state partners have and will continue to produce reports identifying toxics in consumer products that we urge the Commission to take note of and to begin to use its authority uh, to, to protect the public from those, these dangerous chemicals. In 2008, the Maine legislature passed one of the first and strongest state-based chemical policy reform laws known as the Kids Safe Products Act. Under Maine's law, manufacturers must disclose their use of high-priority chemicals of concern in consumer products sold in the state. In 2014, the law was expanded to require the reporting of phthalates by some manufacturers. The report linked to my written testimony 
What Stinks, uh, prepared by our partners at the Environmental Health Strategy Center, analyzes the results of that public reporting, including data on the use of phthalates, showing that hormone-disrupting chemicals are used in a broader range of household products than previously known. In addition to phthalates in clothing and footwear, toys and games, a total of 130 products containing four types of phthalates were reported by 14 manufacturers in household paints and primers, in cleansers, in disinfectants and deodorizers. In 2008, Washington State passed the Children's Safe Products Act, setting requirements for makers of, of children's products being sold in Washington to report to the state if these products contain chemicals on a list of 66 chemicals of high concern to children. Manufacturer reporting began, began phasing in in 2012, and in 2014, an analysis of that reporting by our partners at the Washington Toxics Coalition, called What's on Your List, summarized the chemicals and products reported over a six-month period in 2013. Overall, there were 4,605 reports of such chemicals reported in children's products such as toys, clothing, baby safety products, and bedding, um, a, t a total of 78 companies such as Walmart, Target, Safeway, Walgreens, and Toys R Us reported products containing hazardous chemicals. A total of 49 chemicals such as formaldehyde, bisphenol A, parabens, phthalates, heavy metals, and industrial solvents were reported with health effects that include carcinogenicity, endocrine disruption, and developmental or reproductive toxicity. We anticipate that manufacturer reported data required by the 2014 Vermont law will become available later this year. Manufacturers of products for children under 12 are required to report the presence of 66 chemicals of concern down to the individual product level, and this new level of data will provide valuable information that will help prioritize products and categories of products for review. The Commission should use the data generated by these state programs as a roadmap to additional products that require further evaluation and potential action to protect the health of children from these dangerous chemicals. In addition, we urge the Commission to exercise its authority under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act to ban products containing toxic chemical flame retardants. In spite of the fact that these chemicals have been associated with serious human health problems, inc including cancer, reduced sperm count, increased time to pregnancy, impaired memory, learning def deficits, hormone disruption, lowered immunity, they continue to be used at high levels in consumer products. The comments and testimony previously submitted to the Commission by our partners provide a strong basis for moving forward to the, with the requested rulemaking. These chemicals migrate continuously out from everyday chem household products into the air and dust when we sit on a sofa or put a baby to sleep on a cribs mattress. As a result, more than 97% of U.S. Rev residents have measurable quantities of toxic organohalogen flame retardants in their blood. Children are particularly at risk because they come into greater contact with household dust than adults. Studies show that children whose developing brains and reproductive organs are the most vulnerable have three to five times higher levels than their parents. In conclusion, we urge you to act on the petition to regulate products containing toxic chemical flame retardants and to consider action to reduce, to restrict dangerous chemical exposures from other consumer products. We again thank the Commission for this opportunity to comment on your future activities and priorities, and we look forward to continue, continuing to work with you on your important mission. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Nitschka. Dr. Fox Rawlings. For, thank you for the opportunity, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, I'm speaking today on the behalf of my, our President, uh, Dr. Zayana, Diana Zuckerman, who cannot be here today. The National Center for Health Research is a nonprofit research center staffed by scientists, medical professionals, and health experts who analyze and review research on a range of health issues. Um, we, res expect, re re we respect the essential role that the CPSC has, as well as the challenges that you face in selecting the most important priorities. Phthalates and flame retardants need to be among your top priorities because they are in all of our homes and they migrate from products into our daily environment. Multiple phthalate metabolites and flame retardants are detectable in nearly all people in the U.S. And scientists agree that their impact on health can be dangerous and long-lasting. First, um, most, so these two topics have been discussed previous, 
very many times today, so I'm going to be very brief in our comments. So first I want to talk about the additional bans on phthalates in children's toys and care products. Uh, we applaud the current permanent and temporary bans on six phthalates in children's toys and child care articles. However, these bans need to be extended. The previous rule uh, proposed last um, year, last spring uh, in 2015, following the CHAP uh, recommendations would provide additional protections, protections against children. We support the permanent bans on four additional phthalates, DIBP, DPENP, DHEXP, and DCHP, and making permanent the interim ban on DINP. However, the CHAP report also recommended an interim ban on DIOP, which should also be included in the rule. We strongly disagree with the proposal to lift the intern bans on DNOP and DIDP. While they may not be associated with anti-androgenicity, uh, they are associated with organ toxicity and altered development. The CHAP report also recommended additional studies on three other phthalates, uh, DMP, DPHP, and DEP and six phthalate alternatives, and the final rule should include a timeline for the completion of these studies. In summary, we strongly urge the CPSC to finalize the proposed rule on phthalates in children's toys and child care articles, including consideration of our safety concerns. It is also important for the CPSC to expand this work on phthalates to include safeguards for older children. There's increasing evidence for the impact of these chemicals on early puberty, which itself is, is associated with drug abuse, sexual exploitation, and suicide. Uh, Nick's blame bans on blame retardants. The CPSC has the responsibility and the ability to protect consumers from toxic blame retardants under the Federal Hazardous Substance Act. We agree with other groups commenting today that the CPSC should, prior should propose and finalize regulations that would ban additive non-polymeric um, Organohalogen flame retardants in four ca categories of household products as proposed in petition number HP15-1. Like phthalates, these chemicals move from products in our daily, into our daily environment and from there into consumers' bodies where they can cause irreparable harm. All of the organohalogen flame retardants studied have been associated with chronic health effects. The most well-studied organohalogen um, flame retardants are the PBDEs, which have been phased out due in part to their effects on human health. The alternatives in the same class are providing, proving to have similar problems. These alternatives are found in a large percentage of people tested in various communities. They have been linked to cancer, reproductive problems, neurotoxicity, developmental toxicity, endocrine disruptor, and behavioral changes in models and or humans. And we strongly urge the CPSC to develop and finalize a ban on these chemicals and proposed residential products to protect consumers from their toxic effects. In conclusion, we urge the CPSC to prioritize the research and rulemaking to limit exposure of consumers, and especially children, from phthalates and flame retardants that have been found to have neg negatively impact health and development. And we look forward to working with you on these uh, issues. Thank you for your time and consideration of our views. Thank you, Dr. Fox Rawlings. Uh, I'll just start my round of questioning with you and Ms. Hitchcock. And I don't know if you were here earlier when Mr. Pencina from the Breast Cancer Fund was speaking. So I'll reiterate my concern at a, at a public policy level. Before I came to the commission, I remember when we our first child was born, the scare about BPA. And Ms. Hitchcock, you mentioned BPA on a list. And so everybody scrambled to take BPA out of their products. And as parents, you started looking for BPA-free labels. And I remember going around looking, and you would have this sense of relief if you saw something that didn't say BPA on it. You're like, we're safe. And that's really the key, is that parents think if a chemical is taken out, then everything's OK. And then, of course, lo and behold, not surprisingly, BPS apparently was substituted. And there are concerns about what BPS means. And that's really at the root of my dilemma in this position in the way I approach it is I want to make sure whatever I'm participating in is definitively making people safer when it comes to chemical exposure. And so, and, and again, I'd like to avoid TOSCA reform because I think that's a separate issue to some extent. Just as we consider whether it's issues that are currently in front of us or new chemical-related issues, 
how do we have assurance from a scientific perspective that if we take action against a chemical or a class of chemicals that we are definitively making people safer as opposed to just definitively acting against that chemical? I think that's the $64,000 question, although with inflation, who knows how, how big a More question than you've just asked. Um, I, you're, you're absolutely right to be concerned about regrettable substitutions of the next chemical in line, and BPA and BPS are a very good example. We have lacked a comprehensive chemicals policy. Uh, we have, the, the Congress has just passed and the, uh, the President has on his desk a, uh, a, a reform of the Toxic Substances Control Act, which you've, you've said you're avoiding. Um, so I, I won't dive any farther in. But we do, have, we do have concern about substitutions and we have concern about rational substitutions. There are, though, chemicals that we have a, a large body of scientific evidence that they cause harm. And we, we need to take action, and uh, I move us into the flame retardants world, uh, where, we're, where we have a large volume of scientific evidence uh, to act upon these chemicals. Let's do the thing that we know is the right thing to do. Let's, let's guard against regrettable substitutions and let's remain attentive and vigilant about the next, the next thing coming down and hopefully our, we will begin to review new chemicals coming onto the market more, more carefully. But we ask the Commission to act under its authorities to take action on the things that we already know um, and uh, uh, take action to remove these chemicals that we know are causing harm from everyday consumer products that our children are coming into contact with. Thank you, Doctor. Do you want to add anything? I pretty much would say the same thing. Um, I think as much as we would like to avoid re uh, regrettable substitution. In some ways, there's not much we can do unless we can specify testing before chemicals go on the market. So just saying replacing this bad chemical, we may get another bad chemical is still as a very big problem. And so even though we might get something else as bad, we have to stay on top of it. We have to study it, but we can't keep allowing that to allow bad chemicals that are causing harm in the marketplace. And thank you for that. I, I just find it, uh, just the whole public policy apparatus very frustrating because for the children that are harmed by whatever this generation's wave of chemicals are, they're harmed. And that harm is very unlikely to be undone. And we learn at their expense and that there has to be a better way to do it. Uh, Mr. Alcorn, thank you for coming in. I just have to ask briefly, since we've not had your presence before or your organization's presence before, I'm just curious how you even heard that we're having a priorities hearing. Um, well, we have been working on this issue for uh, almost 10 years now as an organization. Um, but as I said, we began tracking the unintentional child shootings uh, most closely in 2013. And uh, as it's become an issue of greater concern amongst the volunteers that we have around the country, um, the uh, volunteer indicated that this was a hearing that would be important to communicate some of our findings at. Got it. That's good to know. And as we mentioned in the beginning this morning, you know, we're eager to have more robust participation. So it's good to know that the word is getting out. On the issue of uh, gun containers and gun locks, when the as you mentioned, the vice president did reach out and ask the commission to take a role in it. And so the, we did, and we engaged experts, and we asked the ASTM uh, leadership to reopen the standards, which they did. And then what ended up happening, I don't know if you participated in it at all, it turns out there's really, as far as we could tell, basically only one or two people in the entire country who can truly figure out how to defeat these devices in such a way as to show how much the standard has to improve. They participated for a while in the standards process. We, everybody came together, CPSC staff was there. They promised to offer suggestions and then they just sort of disappeared. And the frustration is that we, we didn't have anyone else with the technical expertise who could look at these two standards and say this is what needs to happen. And what was fascinating about these two individuals, and I went out and met with them in South Dakota a few years ago, is that they still retained the innocence and the creativity the way a child can look at a product in a way to defeat it. 
and they would see a product and a mechanism, a way into that, um, that item in a way an adult wouldn't think about. We put limitations on our way of thinking. We, we have most of us, or some of us hopefully have reality imposing some type of burden on us. And these guys somehow still had that childlike approach and so they just had a unique way of doing it. And that's a very long-winded way of saying if you know anyone else who has expertise in gun locks and gun safes who can participate in the ASTM process, that would be very helpful. I think that the map forward from my perspective was to update those two standards and then go to California and engage the state of California and see if they were willing to actually adopt the ASTM standards as well, which would de facto make it nationwide. And I'm sure, as I mentioned that, Commissioner Mohorovic is going to ask about upholstered furniture during his time. But I do think that that would be a critical step to updating those two standards because having done the work on it, they are they're inadequate from a technical standpoint. They just don't provide the level of protection that I think is needed. So please uh, reach out to my office if you have technical experts who can participate in that. I'd appreciate that. I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Mr. Silverberg, thank you so much for coming. So what's the secret? It, you know, we've been hearing for decades, not, I think I have not been alive that long, at least in this capacity, but the agency has been hearing for decades this is an unsolvable problem that can't happen. Uh, it's going to, and even for those who are willing to switch over, it's going to take years and years and this is very te technically difficult and impossible to provide consumer choice, yet somehow you had these magical conversations with your suppliers who I assume are available to other companies as suppliers. What did you do that made a difference that others have not been able to figure out? I drew a line in the sand. There's not a house in the United States that cannot be covered with window coverings, cordless, period and still maintain consumer choice and, and do it so in an economical way? Absolutely. There's stock product right now that's cordless available. There's custom product right now that's cordless available. And um, I'm not sure what the reasoning is to talk about stock product only. Um, custom product is more easily configured by the manufacturer here in the U.S. or the fabricator here in the U.S. And so um, it's, not a, it's not a cost issue. Um, if all the engineering resources of the manufacturers were put to this challenge, it would be solved so quickly. Um, there are products that are available today, as I said, that have no cost impact whatsoever uh, to the consumer that are available cordless or corded at the same price. Um, the engineers can do amazing things. They really can. You give them, in fact, they prefer to be challenged on a daily basis. It is fulfilling for them in their career. And to continue to build the same product with uh, only changing colors or changing sizes, it's, it can't be self-fulfilling for an engineer. Um, I, I don't get it, Chairman. I just don't get it. It can be done. It should be done. And it's, it's not a cost prohibitive uh, venture. Well, I share your belief in the ingenuity and the creativity of industry, and I'm optimistic that, like you said, with the right mindset, we can get there. This has been one of the highest priorities that I've brought to this position from my perspective because it is solvable. It has been going on so long, and, and I think enough is enough. Are you available if the industry does reopen the standard to participate in that and lend your expertise? Absolutely. I'd be, be glad great. to do it. Thank you. And Ms. Iverson, with my last few seconds, I was just curious to know, how large a statue did you remember as erect in honor of Commissioner Mohorovic for his GCC proposal that he put through? And I was here turning off people's microphones and I forgot to turn my own on here. Um, we just had Commissioner Mohorovic at our Product Safety East Conference in New York and that was really a great opportunity as I mentioned before for the Commission really to convey the mission to our members and hear feedback. So obviously we welcome everyone here to participate in further events with AAFA. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, Mr. Alcorn, I'm going to start with you um, and just focus on something different in your presentation. I know I'm not alone in being thoroughly disgusted at the gun deaths in this country and the graph yesterday in the New York Times that brought home what we all sort of know, but the, I'm, I don't know if you saw it or not, but literally the U.S. is 500 percent higher 
than the next closest country in terms of gun deaths in this country. And I know your uh, organization, as I understand it, is focused on gun violence, and obviously this agency is more focused on the at what, what can be done. Um, we, we have very limited jurisdiction. Um, but obviously the only thing we could ever, no matter what, um, do is address accidental deaths. Um, it doesn't take very long in government to appreciate how um, outrageous the ways are in which the hands of government agencies have been tied with respect to making guns safer. Even with gathering data about gun deaths, um, our hands are tied. Um, as one commentator recently said, we regulate toys, so why not guns? Our restriction from Congress comes first in defining a consumer product, um, which does not include firearms or ammunition, and then we're specifically directed um, that we shall make no ruling or order that restricts the manufacture or sale of firearms, firearms ammunition, or components of firearms ammunition, including black powder or gunpowder for firearms, and we're the Consumer Product Safety Commission, but it is what it is. But I thank you for what you're doing, and I agree with you that the data are absolutely critical and they're tough to find. Um, and I know you're using press reports. I know a couple of years ago, I guess it was back in 2013, um, the New York Times, again, I'm sure you saw it, did the study of, of kids involved in deaths with guns that were labeled as homicides rather than, that, than accidents, so that the numbers that were being used by associations like the NRA to argue that there wasn't a problem were half what the real numbers were because of this misnomer of what happens when even an infant shoots a baby. They were labeling it as homicide. So the focus of your presentation, um, as I read it, was on our NICE system. So I just wanted to tell you a couple things. First of all, we all of us here appreciate that the NICE system is the gold standard, but it's still less than 100 emergency departments at hospitals in the United States. Um, but our NICE coding manual does include separate codes for gun locks and gun safes and we collect product information that's publicly available and searchable on those products. However, we also collect incident data that involves unintentional shootings through NICE, but we don't make it public because of our restriction in consumer products not including firearms. So we do gather that data, and we gather both for intentional and unintentional shootings for the CDC. And we've been doing that since 1993 but per an interagency agreement. And as I understand it, we receive about 3,500 reports a year. And the CPSC cannot release that. However, the CDC has um, uh, releases it on the Inter-University Consortium of Political and Social Research. So if you haven't heard of that, which I hadn't until I read your presentation and checked out what we gather, you might want to check that out because I'm told that 22 percent of the firearm cases collected are classified as unintentional. So that may be something that your organization might be able to use and anything that you get by way of data that might be useful for us, we would appreciate you sharing with that with us as well. Mr. Silverberg, thank you, thank you, thank you for going 100% cordless. Um, certainly, I, I think all of us appreciate that the technology's there, that it's not expensive. We could do it, um, but it's been decades that we've been trying to get industry to adopt a voluntary standard. You ask for a mandate, I'm sure you know that for us to do a mandatory standard is a, a Herculean task, um, particularly in this area where there are so many cords, and I am delighted to hear that um, you um, respond to the chair's question that you would participate if we were to open the standard again. Have you done so in the past? Have you participated in any voluntary standard? I have not. Good. Okay. But I'll I don't mean my good that you that. haven't. I mean I'll good that you will. I'll grow my hair to take on that Herculean effort. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm delighted that you will do that, particularly with respect to a hidden hazard like this. Um, Ms. Hitch Hitchcock, um, I know you know that we're going to be receiving a package on phthalates and the non-polymeric um, additive organohalogens um, petition that was, and we should be receiving that. Um, shortly, you have said uh, that you that you think the commission should broaden the scope of consumer products that it reviews um, for the presence and risk of hazardous chemicals. And I'm just curious as to whether you know of any specific products or product categories that you think that we should be reviewing that we're not reviewing. 
In my, tes in my testimony, I linked to uh, two reports from our state partners in Maine and in Washington State where they are reviewing the results of the reporting under their, under their state laws. And I'm, I'm looking at a, a chart here uh, where they, um, they found chemicals of concern in children's clothing and footwear, um, in toys, which obviously you're, uh, you're obviously focused on. Um, we also found uh, tableware um, in um, uh, personal care products um, uh, and uh, in cleansers, in, uh, in items found in the kitchen. Uh, so we would, we would look to those reports um, to find the additional products that aren't that aren't covered as as children's products or for a child under the age of 12. So what those are you. product categories. Are you aware of chemical categories that we are not considering that we should be considering? Um, I, I'm happy to hear that you're considering the flame retardants petition. Um, uh, there are, there are additional uh, pro uh, chemical categories like. Um, formaldehyde, parabens, um, uh, uh, other flame retardants, and other phthalates beyond those covered under the uh, Consumer Product Safety Act. In the category Act. of phthalates? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I w I'd be interested in both yours and um, Dr. Fox Rowling's um, comments on whether, I, I, I hope that you reviewed our um, very robust hearing on the the group that on the petition for the, the for the non-polymeric um, organohalogens that are, that are additive and in four product categories as I'm sure you know, but I, I I guess I'd be interested in your comments since you were not at that hearing on whether you think that you think that that's an appropriate categorization because this is new for us to look at a whole category of flame retardants. It seems fairly reasonable to me. I mean, yeah, it's it's a very big category in some cases, but from what's been studied and the characteristics of those chemicals, it looks like there is a reasonable, a very reasonable chance that the characteristics seen in a good portion of these are going to expand to the rest of them. And by being able to look at a whole category like this, we can avoid the regrettable substitution like we're seeing with some of the phthalates and with the BPAs and BPS. Um, so I think it is reasonable. So let me follow up with if we limit this to the four categories that are in the petition, which are durable infant and toddler products, residential upholstered furniture, mattresses and mattress pads, and plastic casings of electronic devices. Um, my question is, are either of you aware in those four product categories of any safe non-polymeric -poly additive organohalogens? I'm deferring my... <laughs> okay. I just, and if you, and if you just don't know, the that's scientist. fine. I, just, <laughs> um, I can't go into any of the details right now. I can definitely look into the research and let you know, but I know there are alternatives for flame retardants that are safer for, as far as I've been able to understand, most categories of consumer products. And a lot of these um, can, the standards can still be met with even non-flame retardants. So I'm not sure for specifics on which ones require those types of flame retardants. Okay, thank you. Um, and Ms. Iverson, nice to see you again. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm sure you know that we're not partici participating in TTIP and we have no intention in doing so because unlike some of our sister agencies, um, we don't have any mission related to trade. Um, so that's the reason we're not participating. But um, I, the, my question of you is, have you approached any of our European Union counterparts to see it, their attitude about harmonizing because we would love to harmonize, but we're not going to harmonize down, as you know. Yes, I do know that. So I've read some of the Commission's work, and I know that that's a major concern in, um, in the area of watering down standards. So we are working with our European partners, and I know that this is going to be a really important task, and I know that it's going to be difficult, and I know that the Commission has already looked into this. So we continue to work on both sides, um, but I can say that as I mentioned in my testimony, European regulators are signaling that there's going to be a textile provision in the next round. So 
I understand that the CPSC has no intention of working in this area, but there are areas of um, regulatory coherence that we think we can be a part of. So, Good. Good. And I just, all of us supported um, Commissioner Mohorovic's proposal, as you know, with respect to the enforcement policy, and I thank you for your work with him on this common sense proposal. Thank you, and I thank the Commission for that as well. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and for taking the time out to provide your insights onto these, uh, into these very important issues. Um, Dr. Fox Rawlings, in your testimony, well, it's actually it, Diana, uh, Dr. Zuckerman, um, on the bottom of the first page, it says, it's important for CPSC to expand its work on phthalates to include safeguards for older children. There is increasing evidence of the impact of these chemicals on early puberty, which itself is associated with drug abuse, sexual exploitation, and suicide. Can you provide us with that uh, research that's been done and those numbers that you're referring to here? I cannot, but I can talk to uh, Diana and have that sent to you. Very good. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. We did hear in the comments uh, with regards to phthalates uh, the the regrettable substitutes and the concerns for um, substituting one known entity and one known chemical with another one that we don't know anything about. Um, but as you well know that uh, the phthalates package is being worked on by our staff. It is extremely um, complex. Uh, there were several, uh, as you know, many, many comments on it. They're working on g working through those comments, and it's a process, and we expect to see that package um, hopefully by the end of this fiscal year. So thank you for your concerns and your thoughts on, that, on uh, the phthalate issue. Uh, Mr. Soberberg, um, before I have a couple of questions for you, I, I do want to say something because um, both of my colleagues have said this, and I want to make sure that the information out there is accurate. So we may have heard um, that it can't be done, but I don't think we're hearing that now. I think that industry has made it clear to the agency that the technology exists, it's available, consumers have a choice, and it can be done. And the question is, how do we find a way forward? So that may have been the issue a few years ago, but now the issue, I think there's no dispute that the technology is available. Um, and this isn't directed at you, this is directed at my colleagues, um, that we did hear that in the past. But since I've been here, I've heard from industry, and as I mentioned this morning, I've been to the three major manufacturers of them, and they are willing, interested, and able to produce cordless products, and certainly products with, with inaccessible cords. And that's very important to what we're talking about here today. Um, when you made the change, can you talk to us about what happened to the price of the blind? Absolutely. It went up. It cost more. In some cases, it cost a little more. In some cases, it cost um, not much more than a little more, but based on the price of the product to begin with, the ratio of the upcharge was such that it put us in an uncompetitive position. That's easily rectified by mass production of cordless blinds. With volume comes efficiencies and cost reduction. And so if the, if the manufacturers have to make them all cordless, you will see the cost come down dramatically very quickly. Okay. Um, I, I mean, that is certainly um, an acceptable theory, right, that, that um, when we do things in mass production, the price comes down. Um, but I think the difference in, and Commissioner Robinson continues to say this, that we, for Section 9 rulemaking, have extremely difficult obstacles to overcome. And I think what's key here in your testimony and your being here and the decision you made is a business decision that you made, a commendable one, but you made the decision. And that's different than having it be imposed on you. And so I think you should be commended for making that decision and it was a, a business decision you, ma you made. So I just want to point that out. I, I do want to emphasize that the technology is available. I don't think there's any dispute. Um, major manufacturers have made that clear, and um, 
now the question is how do we find a way forward to get to a voluntary standard that addresses this issue. So uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Burkle. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, panelists, uh, for appearing today, especially um, uh, new participants. So it's always good to see um, other associations with interests that recognize that uh, it's important to visit with the CPSC. And uh, Mr. Silverberg, uh, thank you for your long travel. Um, if you could engage me, I don't, I'm not as, uh, forgive me, I'm not as uh, familiar with selectblinds.com. You mentioned you're an online retailer. Yes. Have you Have you always been an online retailer? Yes. You have for the 11, 11 years, I think yes. you've been in business. Yes. Do you sell to subcontractors and contractors, or is it a direct-to-consumer business? It's primarily direct-to-consumer, but we do have a dealer division, which is suffering more than the general part of the business. What, uh, what percent of your business do you think is direct-to-consumer? You had Nine, to guess. 95 percent. 95 percent. Yes. Direct-to-consumers writing you, selecting credit card information, and um, you cut a PO and you send product out. Yes. Excellent. Um, now, you made the decision to go cordless in November of 2015. Uh, tell me about that decision making. W was it, did you, was it your team? Is it, uh, tell me a little bit about that, that moment that you, uh, that you decided, look, we're going to make a business decision and we're going to go completely cordless. I drove it 100%. Um, I have uh, understood that window blind cords were killing kids when I heard the first recall or retrofit and on Roman shades right and um, coming from uh, an industry where I was cutting the cords previously in consumer electronics with telephones yeah uh, <laughs> right I've been cutting the cords my whole life um, but I, I, I don't know what the what, what the trigger was that hit me so hard but it just really impacted me that we were selling a product that is dangerous to kids CPSC compliant product is killing kids still and I just couldn't get up in the morning look myself in the eye in the mirror and go to work knowing that we were selling a product that's dangerous to kids these are innocents it's our responsibility to give them the most safe environment that we possibly can and to cut the cord is not cost prohibitive uh, and what parent wouldn't pay 20 or 30 or 40 dollars more a window to make sure they have a safe product for their children. Right. Yeah, if they were aware of the hazard too, right, and appreciated right. it. And, and that's why I say that uh, an education program is uh, also necessary to go hand in hand with this because even if we decided today that not another corded blind will be sold, there's 140 or million households in the U.S., 150 million households in the U.S., it's going to take a long time to cycle through all those products. But we have to start somewhere, we have to start someday, and we just made the decision that we're not going to wait any longer. Um, and we started March 31st because April 1st was April Fool's Day, and I didn't want any confusion in the industry <laughs> that we were playing a joke. <laughs> and uh, April was a tough month for us, uh, I'll admit it. Uh, but in May, we actually had a higher revenue number than we did in May last year. So it's not 100% uh, detrimental to any business. Yeah, you mentioned that it does put you at a competitive disadvantage, but you've been able to thrive still in a cordless environment. Absolutely. And, and, the, and, and the one category that we've been the most successful in, which is honeycomb or cellular shades, um, we have been working with our manufacturers on making them cordless for us for years, and we have a, a, a very small surcharge for the cordless solution on, on those. Um, but, but the reality is there are additional uh, solutions necessary to make every window cordless uh, accessible and because some are hard to reach, some are behind furniture, um, some people are uh, not able to reach high enough to, to get the window shade all the way open. Uh, and motorization is, is an example of a technology that will address any window, uh, but it's going to take more work to get the motorization cost down. It's a, that, that is a, an expensive proposition today, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Motorization is, um, it's a radio. We, we make radio frequency products available at uh, reasonable prices in many categories of products, in including cordless phones, which nobody buys them anymore because everyone has a cell phone. 
but remote control for your TV, remote control for um, your lights, remote control for your thermostat. Uh, we, we remote control everything. Right. Just watch out for those button cell batteries in there, right? Exactly. So in November of 2015, did you come to the conclusion that all corded window blinds present an unreasonable risk of injury or death? I came to the conclusion that it is not possible to determine from our side what is or is not reasonable to expect uh, uh, from a cordless or corded product in, in the home use. And the only way to be sure that the expectation is met, that the blind will be safe, is to sell it without a cord. Mm -hmm. And you've got, with 95% of your sales, you've got direct ability to contact uh, all of your, uh, everybody who has purchased corded blinds. Over, from a million, you. over a million customers. Have you, what kind of information have you subsequently sent out to those customers of yours who have, you've, you've um, made and sold to them corded blinds? We email them on a weekly basis. We have educated them as uh, much as we can. We have, uh, we have implemented a uh, Go Cordless initiative where um, we'll, we have committed to completely retrofit one home a month for any family that submits a story that is uh, going to give us the feeling that they, they're the most deserving of, of anybody who submits their request to have us uh, make their home all cordless. A previous customer. A, a, a previous, no, a new oh, customer. Oh, any, any, any customer. new customer, too. And uh, we take this very seriously. Before we went all cordless, we offered every consumer, any consumer that wanted a cord cleat for every window in their house, we sent them out for free. But cord cleats are not the answer. Cord cleats are, uh, just earlier this year, uh, a kid was strangled by a, a cord cleat blind that was properly wrapped and, and it didn't prevent the, the tragedy. Have you, um, have you plans to recall your corded product with CPSC through a fast track recall? No. no. Why not in terms of commitment? I mean, I, I recognize some of your language and I know it's rhetoric to be, you know, to have the best possible impact. Um, and let me ask you one quick question first. When, did I hear you correctly when you said 19 deaths, I mean months. Was that purposeful or was that truly a slip? It was intentional. It was intentional. Okay, I thought so. Uh, it wasn't missed on me. But you did mention that we're playing Russian roulette with children. And you've sold corded product to family. You have the ability to reach them and to offer them a repair, a recall, or a refund. And I'm just curious how you can make that commitment and yet not want to... Um, uh, to offer them without charge your cordless product? Well, you know, I could do that, but I would be out of business pretty quickly, right, if I, if I, I gave everybody free blinds. But uh, I appreciate the comment, and I do take it to heart, and it is something that we've thought about. And we are um, actually working very hard to come up with what is the right financial model where we can offer a discount uh, to such a degree that anybody can replace their corded blind with a cordless blind. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is yet, but uh, um, trying to think of a way. Cut your cord, send us your cord, we'll give you a 50% discount on a cordless blind. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if that will work. We, we have to run the models, but um, uh, we also have to stay in business. I recognize that. Right, and we don't want to put the American consumer out of business, and I think one of the things that's missed in a lot of uh, regulatory consideration is how regressive regulation is. It, it, uh, it disproportionately impacts low-income folks in terms of price points, whether it's table saws or cordless product in terms of price point increases. And if, if you believe that we should mandate only cordless blinds by regulation, do you also think that we should tolerate corded blind in the marketplace, or should we, in fact, along the same rationale, uh, recall all corded blinds in the United States? How could we, how how could one tolerate corded blinds in the marketplace that possess that that present a risk if one believes that risk is there, and yet at the same time justify a mandatory standard? It's been done for decades. Look at the auto industry. Seat belts. We didn't recall cars. We didn't retrofit cars. They worked their way through. What about the third brake light in a window? 
We didn't call all the cars back in. We didn't say you had to retrofit your cars. It just happens to take time, and eventually uh, what you see on the street is a car that is meeting the standards and not seeing cars that don't meet the standards. And the same thing has to happen in window blinds. Thank you. Thank you for your candor. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you to the panel, Dr. Fo Fox Rowling, Ms. Hitchcock, Mr. Alcorn, Mr. Silverberg, Ms. Iverson. We appreciate your testimony coming here today. Just a few other items as we wrap up. I do want to remind folks who may be paying attention online or, of course, who are here that we will keep the record open for one week. So for any of the information that may have been requested or any additional information that folks would like to uh, provide the agency, please do so. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, uh, for the record, we did receive additional written comments from folks who were not able to testify. I do want to mention who they are. The Iowa ATV Injury Prevention Task Force, Earth Justice and a coalition of organizations along with them, Public Citizen, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, Zippo Manufacturing, the Outdoor Power Equipment Institute, Outdoor Industry Association, the National Retail Federation, the Toy Industry Association and the Natural Resources Defense Council. We all did go through their testimony very closely and we're pleased to have them submit that. And finally, uh, I do want to acknowledge our executive director and her staff, her office of the secretary. Thank you, Todd, for the work that you did and for facilities office and everybody for making this happen. We very much appreciate everything that goes into it. It was seamless and that is because of the staff work behind the scenes that made it all work. So thank you very much for those who attended, who submitted testimony, who watched online. This concludes this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission.